This is just the second video for Monopoly. So I want to talk just a little bit uh, more about welfare. Uh, picking up from uh, what we were doing last time, looking at the um, profit maximizing choice of the monopolist, and then uh, looking at the, uh, the implications this has for efficiency. So what we were doing last time is setting up a model for uh, an individual monopolist and looking at profit maximization choice of the firm. And so what we want to do, uh, what I want to do here is show you sort of how this outcome that the monopolist picks when they face no competition in the market uh, compares against a case where you have perfect competition. So for my setup here, uh, let's start with just uh, a description of an individual firm that we're looking at. So I have a firm producing good Q, and then we'll say there's a demand curve that's given for the product. So like last time, let's say we have some sort of linear demand. So Q equals maybe 300 minus one half times P, for example. All right, so that's my linear demand for good Q. And then I have um, the firm here that's producing the product, uh, we'll say has a total cost function. So I'm just gonna say the total cost is something like uh, 10 times Q. All right, this time I'll ignore any fixed costs and I'm gonna make the cost function really simple. Uh, so that's sort of easy to work with. Uh, in this case, my uh, geometry and stuff, calculating efficiency, dead weight loss, sort of uh, it's easiest with a simple total cost function. Okay, so the idea is that um, when you have a, a, a market setting, uh, depending on whether you're monopoly, perfect competition, or otherwise, this will impact what sort of outcome or equilibrium we see in a market. And then we can sort of make these sort of efficiency judgments. So one example would be a case where we're going to say we have some perfect competition. So first off, let's say one example is uh, we're thinking about a market where you have perfect competition. Now, I'm not going to do a really good job setting this up. Uh, rather, I'm using this only as a, a benchmark against what you would see um, here compared to if we set the market up like a monopolist. So for per perfect competition, uh, what's to remember is we have uh, many firms. The way to sort of think about that in the context here is that maybe they all uh, are identical. So they all have, say, a similar cost function like TC equals 10Q. And what these firms are doing is maximizing profit. So in a perfect perfectly competitive market, uh, there's some sort of market price that they take is given. So they're given a price. And that price is something that their own individual decisions, so a certain, a specific firm um, has no impact on, like we talked about before. So what a, a single firm would do in this case, uh, so there's like a representative company or firm, they're all behaving the same way. A single firm here is going to be choosing some sort of output um, to maximize profit. And when we were doing that before, uh, previous, uh, a couple of weeks ago, looking at these individual firms in a competitive market, when they maximize profit, what happened is we got that first order condition where uh, they pick a quantity um, such that uh, the marginal revenue that they're earning on the product uh, equates with the marginal cost. And so what happens here in this particular example is the marginal revenue is just gonna be equal to the market price. And then in this case, the marginal cost, I'm just gonna use this right here. So if I take the derivative of this, it would be 10. Now, this is, gets actually a little bit more complicated if I try to model this correctly. Like, I'm going to need an increasing marginal cost to kind of make the problem well-defined. But this is, we're just kind of keeping it a little bit loose so that I can, uh, I can uh, keep things relatively straightforward when I model the monopolist. Um, but the point is that when we have perfect competition, the market price 
um, that we see in the market. Uh, so the, the P that sort of precipitates um, will equal marginal cost of production. So say so just to kind of get a feel for how that might look in a graph, what I can do is uh, graph a market for good Q and use this demand curve here. And we can see where the, the market price is. So if I do something like this, say where I have um, Q here, and if I plot my demand curve, you have something like this. So this is my demand. And for quantity demanded, I'm just using this equation 300 minus one half P that we had up a minute ago. And so what happens is if you plot in that marginal cost, um, what you get is something like this. And so in a perfectly competitive market, if we have many firms competing with each other, they sort of keep, keep producing uh, output until the, um, the marginal cost of production equals price. And so what happens is you get a price in the market um, that's equal to the marginal cost of production 10. So the amount of units that would trade if we set the market up like this would be um, whatever demand is at a price of 10. So at P of 10, when we plug that in, right, we have quantity demanded equals 300 minus one half of 10. So 300 minus, minus five would be 295. <laughs> And so I'd have 295 units that would trade at a competitive market price uh, of $10. Um, what happens here, right, is uh, you get a market equilibrium where you have uh, the competitive price is $10 and then the amount that trades is the 295 units. And so if you're looking at welfare, uh, you're looking at welfare, um, what you're going to do is uh, look at the consumer surplus that gets generated at this equilibrium point. And so for welfare, what I can do is look at consumer surplus. And what I'm measuring is the, the benefit to the consumers from participating in the market when the price for the product is $10. So there I'm looking at um, the area under demand here and above price. So I can use that one half base times height. And the base here would be, be the 295 and the height would be um, whatever this is here, uh, vertical distance. So I need the vertical intercept on the demand curve. So I need this uh, for this equation right here. Um, I need a price that would make this zero. So I think this is gonna be 600. So I put 600 in here, half of 600 is 300 and that's zero. So I have vertical intercept of 600. So my height would be, it looks like 590. Okay, and so my consumer surplus in the market at the competitive market equilibrium would be this right here. Let's just do that real quick. <laughs> Less 295, 590 times, 295 is divided by two. So I think I have 87.320. Okay, so that's my consumer surplus in the market equilibrium. The producer surplus is always basically the area under price and above uh, the marginal cost of production. So in this case, in a competitive market, what happens is this is just zero. So there's no uh, there's no consumer there's no producer surplus when the firms are making zero economic profit. And so for my consumer surplus, what I have is just this area here. So this entire triangle, zero producer surplus, and um, uh, of course no dead weight loss. So no inefficiency in the competitive market. The idea is that if we do think about the points on the demand curve here as a reflection of marginal benefit of consumption, which is a way to interpret the demand curve, then the 
Competitive equilibrium here at 295 units um, is efficient because what I'm doing is I'm producing and supplying the product to everybody in this market who has a marginal benefit of consumption that exceeds the marginal cost of producing it, which is what I would do for efficiency. So if people have marginal benefit of consumption, like somewhere here, whatever that is, right? Like 24, 26, something like that. The cost of making the product's only 10. So anytime the marginal benefit, anytime marginal benefit is greater than equal to marginal cost, the idea is the product should be produced and distributed to the consumer for consumption. All right, so that's sort of what's socially optimal. And uh, this is exactly what the competitive market setting achieves. So you go all the way out to 295 units and at a price of 10, basically everybody who has a marginal benefit greater than the cost of production, the marginal cost of production, which is 10, indeed buys the product and gets it. All right, so we get this sort of socially um, optimal outcome in a perfectly competitive market. And this can be our sort of benchmark. Um, the total surplus in the market, you can call this total surplus because uh, what you do technically is you're adding up consumer surplus and producer surplus uh, to get your total surplus. In this case, the producer surplus is zero, so it sort of uh, just collapses to whatever the consumer surplus is. All right, so what I want to do is just show you now, uh, right, with that benchmark, um, like I said, it's a little bit loose here, but it'll work. You can see the basic idea. Uh, what would happen if now we convert the market to a monopoly setting? So same, same primitives here. So we'll use these, uh, these cost and demand parameters, uh, but now just say there's a single firm rather than, uh, than multiple firms competing with another uh, like per competition. So this is similar to what we did last time. So it's not too bad. Just uh, convert this to monopoly. And uh, we have a firm trying to maximize profit again. And so what I want to do is I want to solve that problem, first of all, and figure out what Q star is, so the monopolist choice. So to maximize profit, what we do is we're looking at price times output, Q, uh, minus my total cost, which is just 10Q in this case. All right, so that's my total revenue. That's my total cost. Um, I need the price again like before. So if I take the demand curve that's given, which is 300 minus one half times P. <laughs> um, hang on a second. I can solve the demand curve for inverse demand. So I have one half P equals 300 minus Q. So P equals, was that 600 minus two times Q? All right, and this is my inverse demand. <coughs> so I'm gonna substitute that back uh, in here into the revenue. So I'm trying to maximize profit, price is 600 minus two Q. Um, times Q minus 10 Q. So if we distribute that, we have 600 Q minus 2 Q squared, right? That's 10 Q. And to maximize this, what we'll do is take the derivative, set that equal to zero, and solve for the critical point. So, First derivative would be 600 minus 4Q minus 10 equals zero. So it looks like 590 equals 4Q. Or if I divide that by four, one point seven point five. 
right? So that would be my uh, profit maximizing choice uh, for the monopolist. All right, and so what we want to do is uh, sort of look at welfare implications. So I'm going to go back to the graph again. So let's graph that market for good Q, and we'll position the output here at this choice by the monopolist, and then we can sort of analyze efficiency implications. So, um, so here we go, right? So set up a market like this. And I have my demand curve. So this is my demand. So quantity demanded is 300 minus one half times P. Um, you can see your marginal revenue uh, and marginal cost here, right? So my marginal revenue would be the derivative of total revenue. So the marginal revenue is the 600 minus 4Q. And the marginal cost is the uh, derivative of the total cost. Total cost is just 10Q. So the derivative 10Q, of course, is just 10. All right, so I can use those here in my picture. So my, my graph here for demand, I think I had the vertical intercept 600 there. And um, when P is zero, this would be 300. Uh, the marginal revenue is 600 minus 4Q. So if you graph that, that just goes down here like this. And my marginal cost looks like this. Not 10. Okay. okay, so what the monopolist is doing is picking this point here, which we said Q star was 147.5. All right, so that's my monopolist profit maximizing choice. The price they charge, we can calculate by just going up to the demand curve, right? And they calculate the price they would need to charge in order to sell off 147.5 units. So at, um, at QM, equaling 147.5, um, we can calculate what the price is using the inverse demand curve. So if I go back over here real quick, um, this was my inverse demand. So I'm gonna plug that 147.5 in here to see what the price needs to be. So 147.5 times two, is that? You get 305, so 305. Monopolist price. So in the same picture, right now, what I can do is drop down uh, that market equilibrium we had when the market was perfectly competitive. So if you remember, in a competitive market, the price gets driven down to a uh, marginal cost of production, which is ten, and we had a certain number of units to trade, which I think was. 295. So this right here, I think I call it quantity under a competitive market. All right, so clearly, right, if we're starting to compare a couple things, you can see in a competitive market, you have more production. And obviously it's being charged, they're charging a lower price. So that alone isn't a problem, right? The problem in terms of efficiency is, um, with the monopolist is you get this dead weight loss under the monopoly that you didn't see in the competitive market. So for the dead weight loss, what we're looking at is that um, surplus that's lost from the fact that the monopolist cuts production back from 295 to only 147.5 units. So in this case, basically everything <laughs> under this demand curve here and above that price, or I'm sorry, the marginal cost of production would be consumers that sort of lose out and don't get the product. 
So for my dead weight loss, we use that formula one half base times height. And my dead weight loss here would just be this area. So um, under demand and above the marginal cost of production. Um, again, the, the intuition is that there are consumers with marginal benefit numbers that exceed the cost of production, yet they don't get the product. So anybody past 147.5 with marginal benefit numbers down here um, aren't trading in the market, all right? And so that's a loss of surplus, which I can calculate as a base would be uh, this distance here, right? So 295 minus 147. And the height would be this right here. So 305 minus 10, which is 295. All right, so that would be my dead weight loss calculation. It's just that. So something like this, 221. 756. That's of a $21,000, $756 dead weight loss in the market uh, because of the monopolist, right? And this is my inefficiency. There is consumer surplus that still remains in the market. So consumer surplus is very high in a competitive market. In a monopoly market, there still are consumers that are still trading. So when consumers are trading in the market, even if the market's not competitive, in this case, monopoly, I can still measure consumer surplus. So what I wanna do is just focus in on the consumers that are actively trading or buying the product in the market and look at the area under the demand curve, right? Marginal benefit and above the market price they're paying. So my consumer surplus, again, is gonna be <laughs> a right triangle here like this, where I'm looking at um, a consumer surplus right here. So basically under this demand curve and above the current price that we see in the market, which is 305. So my, my consumer surplus would be one half and my base would be 147.5 for the Blue triangle. And then the height would be 600 minus 305, which is 295. I think this is going to be the same as this. Let's see, what is that right? 295. So two, one, seven, five, six. All right, so there is consumer surplus. Clearly it's lower than what we had in perfect competition. Perfect competition, it was much higher. Basically the entire area under demand above marginal cost, so 87. Um, so that's dropped down, it's lower. Um, you, you do get producer surplus now though, no surprise, right? So the, the monopolist is making profit. And so I get some uh, producer surplus here in the market, and this would just be the area under the price that the monopolist is charging, right? So the price they charge is the money that comes into the firm. And then you subtract out the, the marginal cost of production, which is 10. And the difference, the difference between the price that they charge and the cost of making it is what we call producer surplus. So that is, I don't know, black pen, is gonna be this right here. So this whole area. Uh, yes, yes. So basically under market price, which is 305 and above marginal cost of production, which is 10. So base times height. And you have a base of 147.5 and a height of 305 minus 10. So 147.5 times 295 is... So 43, 512.5. Okay, so 
In terms of the geometry here, what you can see kind of if you compare the two, in a perfectly competitive market, there's no dead weight loss, zero producer surplus because we have the firms making zero profit, um, but the consumer surplus is the entire triangle. So we get the 87,320. Once you put the monopolist in, what the monopolist does is cut back on production, price goes up, and the monopolist starts making positive producer surplus. The consumer surplus shrinks. But what's most important is that there is some surplus here, call it like potential surplus, right, that nobody gets. And that's what the economists care about. So usually the first sort of guess, if someone get asked, uh, you know, what's wrong with the monopolist, people might point to the producer surplus in that the monopolist is gouging the consumers, charging a really high price. As a great example, right? Cost $10 to make the product, but we're charging $305. It's quite a markup. That's not the inefficiency though, right? That, pro that surplus is going, the producer surplus is all going somewhere. It goes to the firm. So what alarms economists, right? Or what they would say the problem with the monopolist is the fact is that you have surplus, potential surplus here, and this deadweight loss um, that goes to no one, right? That's what they call it, sort of a, like a lost surplus. And uh, that's the source of the inefficiency. So you notice if you add these up probably, right? If you add this up, this up, and this up, so these three here, you should get, probably get back to the 87, um, if I did my math right. So, um, how do you get around this? The one thing we sort of talked about briefly is um, you can do price discrimination. Uh, one is if the firm is able to do price discrimination where they can sell the same product though at different prices, uh, then the monopolist is willing to increase his production. So what they'll do is start lowering the price and charging new consumers um, uh, a lower price than the previous consumers. So in fact, if you allow uh, one form of price discrimination and it's called perfect price discrimination. And there's a bunch of other ones like second degree and so on, you sort of read about those, but um, they all fall into the same category of charging different customers, different prices. So some forms of price discrimination are like you can just charge two prices. Uh, perfect price discrimination is kind of as it sounds. It's sort of a monopolist's ultimate dream. And what happens there is they charge a, um, a unique price uh, to each consumer. So what I can do is uh, the price that I'm charging, right, uh, will vary uh, consumer by consumer. And so if I have a consumer with a marginal benefit um, that exceeds my marginal cost of production, then what I'm going to do is I'm going to sell it to them. And I can find the price I need to charge. And this is my cost of production. So... Um, that's one consumer. And then what, of course, I can do is, is if I'm allowed to charge as many specific unique prices as I want, um, I can go to the next consumer who has a lower marginal benefit and charge them a, a different price, something lower than this guy. And then uh, I get surplus again when I, when I sell it to that person. Um, and what I do is I continue to do this up and down the demand curve charging everybody a unique price. So you sort of have to have an idea what the marginal benefit is that they'll be willing to pay, you charge them that price. And then what happens is this entire triangle just becomes producer surplus. And what you get here is the monopolist will keep producing until they get all up to 295. And so under perfect price discrimination, actually what you get is uh, an efficient outcome. All right, maybe a little counterintuitive, right? And that if you can get uh, the monopolist to have the ability to pull off perfect price discrimination, we restore efficiency. This is notoriously difficult. 
Uh, one main problem with price discrimination is if you look at uh, this guy down here, who's getting charged a price of like $12, right? So my marginal cost was 10. So I charge him $12 for the product. Uh, it costs 10 to make, right? And that's the reason I did it. Um, if I'm doing this though, in sort of a, a real life application, then of course, what one, one problem with this is secondary markets. So if there's people down here that can buy these products at these sort of low prices, $12, $11. Then I might try to take the product into a secondary market and sell it to this guy up here who was paying something like $5.95 and say, look, I'll give it to you for $400 or $300, even $100, right? But, uh, and then I get a big markup over what I pay. So a big problem with this is secondary markets. If you're charging people different prices, then the people that get it at a low price can turn around and try to undercut you and sell it to... Uh, the customers are charging a high price, right? It's almost like what you're doing is unraveling the whole monopoly thing then. Sort of the perfect price discrimination is leading to competition, so to speak, where these customers are getting the product and turning themselves into entrepreneurs and undercutting you when you're charging really high prices. So this can be very difficult to do. Um, another way to solve this, right, instead of price discrimination is regulation. And so the idea is similar. Like if you take that, that market again, where I have that, that same demand curve like this and a marginal cost of 10 and uh, the monopolist, if they're allowed to do whatever they wanted, they wanted to produce this and charge this price. So what is this? 305. All right, and that's where marginal revenue and marginal costs were equal down here. So if you do regulation, then of course, uh, there's sort of questions of like, uh, what what exactly is the, the government or the regulator allowed to do? What sort of capacity do they have? Do they have the information? Um, do they have the ability to control output or price and so on? Um, if, you, if you sort of say, well, sky's the limit and do whatever you want, then what you can do, right, is you can just say that uh, you say something like a regulation could be um, you force the the firm to charge a price equal to marginal cost of production. So in this case, uh, you want to buy electricity, it only costs ten dollars or whatever. And then say something like anybody who wants to buy at this price, you have to supply. So if a customer calls up FPL and says, yeah, I'd like to hook up to the network and buy electricity. I know the price is $10, so I'm willing to pay it. Then FPL is regulated and said, okay, I have to supply you. All right, and of course, if you do that, what's going to happen is you're going to drive the, the equilibrium to this, this competitive 295, right? So you can sort of balance it here. All right, so with regulation, depending on sort of what the rules are, you can... Uh, you can move the monopolist to the efficient uh, point, right? And so that's one reason why they have some of the regulation. Um, okay, I think that's good enough. I'm gonna stop there and I'll put some homework together for you guys.